Hello, my name is Joel Stratner and I'm with Thermo Fisher Scientific. And we're here today to talk about data importing and processing data in Chromelion. So before we get started, um, I just wanted to make a, a couple notes here. There will be some live Q&A sessions after this recording, which we will schedule at another time. So please do write down any questions that you may have because we will address these in a live session. Um, also, just a, a couple of good housekeeping notes. Um, I am working from home with a three and a six year old, so I do apologize in advance if you hear any background noise or for some reason they come running up. Um, trust me, we are trying to keep them out of the office, but as anyone with young children know, when they want something, they're pretty tenacious. Um, so with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I anticipate this to take us about an hour. And as I mentioned, we're going to look at importing non chromelian data. Um, and then we're going to take that non chromelian data and we're going to look at processing and we're going to look at integration, um, naming of components and how to set up your calibration. All right. So those are the three major topics of, of today's session. So we'll go ahead and start out with the data import topic. Um, in order to import data into Chromelion, we need to open our console. So the console is the home screen. To get to the console, you would just double click on the Charlie icon, the Chromelion icon, and you are opened up to the console. I like to think of this as the pre-data acquisition area. Um, this is where we're going to create sequences. We're going to set up our injection list. We're going to control instruments, equilibrate instruments. Um, you can launch e-workflows, but none of your data processing is done in the console, which is why I refer to it as the pre-data acquisition portal. And then when we go to process the imported data, we're actually going to do this in the studio, um, and we're going to look at how all data processing and reporting and all that stuff happens in the studio. Okay. And for many of you, I know that you're familiar with Agilent software. So another uh, difference that I would like to point out is there's no online or offline mode with Chromelion. Um, everything is done within the console or studio. Uh, a big difference is, is when you launch a sequence in Chromelion, so when you start a sequence, you can actually close the studio in the console. The data will still acquire, and you freed up an additional user license. All right, so that's a big difference. You don't have to keep this open while we work, uh, while we're acquiring data in, in a sequence, OK? All right, so the first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to import this data. So what we'll do is we'll, in the console, click on File, Import Bulk Data. So if it's a Chromelion data file, then you'll just import it natively here. If it's a non-Chromelion file, like an Agilent file or a CDF file, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and choose Bulk Data. Now, when you do this, you can have actually, you can add individual files, so you can add a, a full folder. In this case, I'm going to add the folder. Um, I have this folder of, of data on my desktop. So I'm going to go ahead and choose that folder and hit OK. Now I'm going to select the item that I'm importing and I can tell it where I want it to go. So I can click on the destination parent, click on the ellipsis, and we're going to have a, a, a folder that uh, represents what's set up in our data vault here. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in the DuPont folder. Everything else is good and then I'm going to go ahead and import. Now be patient. This can take a, a minute or so, depending on the size of the sequence. You know, how much data is there? How many injections are there? Is there 3D data that we're trying to import or not? Um, so, so bear with it through the import process. But this is going and correlating everything and making sure there's no duplicate files or anything like that. Um, and then it's going to give us uh, an injection list of, of items that we want to import. And then we're going to go ahead and click the import button. So just hang tight for a moment here while it parses through all the data and gets it ready for import. Um, when we import data, depending on what file format you, you've imported, um, some things may come over. So if you export, you know, a, a .d file or .m file or something from Agilent, you know, you'll get some stuff in your processing method. You can get, you know, component names. You might get some retention times, right? There's going to be some generic information, but we use a different algorithm, um, you know, different way of processing data. So you're not going to get the same detection settings and stuff like that, but there will be some things that can come over. All right, so now we can see we have our, our injections for the sequence import. 
Um, different colors every other injection just to make it easier to read. Uh, we do want to go ahead and import the sequence, so we're just going to click OK. So it's going to import that data. Again, this can just take a moment to actually get the data inside of Chromillion. Uh, but what you're going to see is it's going to store it in this data vault under the DuPont folder, and we'll see the sequence there pop up momentarily. Now, do keep in mind, everything in Chromillion is stored in a data vault. So what a data vault is, is it's a combination of raw files. So your X and Y points from your detector, your time and response, and metadata. Uh, metadata in Chromillion's instrument methods, processing methods, report templates, things like that. So your raw data files are going to get stored in one location. Your metadata is going to get stored in a SQL Server Express database, unless, of course, you have an enterprise edition and then it's SQL Server or Oracle. OK, so our import is complete, as we can see. So I'm going to ahead and close that. And then we have our sequence here. Go ahead and click on that to make sure. And now we have all the data here. So we actually see there is a generic processing method that was uh, created that came over with this. We'll talk about that in a moment. But now we have all of our injections here. And you can see we have about 26 injections. Um, you may also notice that there's a little truck next to the two vials on our sequence. That little truck shows that this is an imported sequence. All right, so we know that this data was not natively acquired by Chromillion, but imported. So now what we want to do that the data has been imported is we want to convert this data so that we can process it using the Chromillion algorithms. So before I can do anything in the studio, I'm going to go ahead and click convert. The data has been imported. I'm going to that and it's saying now we're going to be able to process the data using the Chromillion algorithms if we choose to continue. So I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. Now I've imported this data. And you can see that the truck changed from a blue color to kind of a tan color. That means that it's been imported and converted. So at this point, we're now ready to start playing with the data, start processing the data. Now, before we actually start integrating and everything, I want to take a moment to talk about our injection list here and what many of these columns mean. OK, so the first column that we're going to see in my injection list is what we refer to as the mini plot. Now, this is a snapshot of your chromatography. Um, as you can kind of see now, based on the view settings that I have, I've only, I'm only seeing the tops of a couple peaks. We can change those settings in the studio so that it shows the whole chromatogram or just maybe a critical pair. Uh, but this is going to be, you know, an actual snapshot of your chromatogram. From there, we have the naming column. So this is just the name of the injection. Um, you know, you can fill out anything that you want. I believe there's a 255 character limit in there. So you've got a lot of flexibility on what you want to name these things. Now, you know, good procedures to name things before you run the sequence, of course, but in the event that you did not, you can always come back and change the name of the injection, or if you found you made a mistake, you can make that change. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say you can do will, of course, be defined by the user management and the privileges associated with your role. So let's say we're in a highly regulated QC environment and you may not want people to make those changes. We can lock that privilege down so that you can't alter the injection list after the sequence. Uh, but by default, this is something you can certainly do, right? And it'll be up to your management team to decide what privileges and actions you have inside uh, Chromillion when you start using it. But again, we can go ahead and name things. Um, you know, a quick couple shortcuts. F2 is uh, insert cursor. So if you want to insert a cursor somewhere, you can hit F2. If you want to refresh, you're going to hit F5. And if you want to fill down, you're going to hit F9. Okay, so fill down is going to save us a lot of time. Now, you know, the idea would be to create, you know, templates and, and things that you can start from. So you're not renaming things every time, especially if you're running in a routine environment. You know, you just want to be able to get a sequence and go as quickly as possible. And there's a lot of tools that we have for that. Um, and we can talk about that in another session. But I just wanted to let you know that, you know, for now, we're going to talk everything as this is our first sequence that we've imported into the software. And we don't have these base templates yet. All right, so past the name, we now get to type. Now, type is a very important um, column here, okay? So you can see we have a couple different selections of what we can choose for a type. Now, the first injection we have here is a blank. So I can go ahead and choose a blank as a type here. Now, we do have to be careful for instrumentation. Um, sometimes a blank will not actually inject. It will just run the instrument method, so you're acquiring a background signal. Many folks might do this if you want to do a, uh, you know, a blank subtraction of the profile. 
But in any event, if you choose blank, we just want to make sure that blank equals inject if you want an injection to actually occur. That would happen in the instrument method. Agilence by default will inject a blank sample. Pretty much every other vendor, though, considers a blank as a non-inject. Um, so if you do run Chromillion on a non-Agilent system and you use blank, we're going to want to double check the instrument method. The other thing that you can do to be safe is you can always just call it a matrix. If you call it a matrix, it'll act like a blank. There is matrix subtraction as well, so you can subtract peaks that are identified in the blank, but this will always inject. So if you have any questions, um, you know, just use matrix, but if you understand that blank equals injects for Agilent and not inject by default for other instruments, you'll be good. From there, we see we have two standards. So here's where we're going to want to call them calibration standards. All right, so anything that we're going to use to quantitate, anything that we want to be part of our calibration part needs to be called a calibration standard. Again, all of this can be set up after the data has been acquired, depending on your privileges. Okay. Now, from there, we have a lot of different samples, so we're going to leave those as our unknowns. Typically, our samples will be the unknown type, and then we have additional standards. Now, these may be check standards. So if you don't want them in the calibration plot, they're just used to confirm that you know, you're getting your residuals with after these 10 samples injections, we can just call it a check standard. If this is to be used in the calibration, though, we want to call it a calibration standard. And then we're going to go down. We see another check standard here, so I'm going to change that. And at the end, we're closing out with the check standard. Now, there are some default calculations like amount deviation that are built in for check standards. That'll show you how much it deviates from the calibration standard. So it depends on what your calculation is, if you're doing residuals or amount deviation, you know, what type of recovery calculation are you performing? Um, all of them are easily achieved within Chromillion, but there are some default settings that you want to be aware of. Now, the next column here you'll see is level, and for many of these is grayed out. Now, it's grayed out because there's no concentration level for your, uh, for your samples. That's what we're trying to determine. Okay, so what this level is, it is a concentration level. So anything that you would have a known concentration for, example, a standard or a check standard, we're going to choose the level. If we're doing a single point calibration, all of this is just going to be level one. Okay, so all of these would just be the same prep, same vial, um, you know, that we or same ball flask or however you made your dilution, just vialed multiple times. Now, if it is truly a different prep, if this is a different standard concentration, we're actually going to create a different level. So this would be a multi-point calibration. Okay. Now you may have confirming standards. So these standards may be, you know, all level one. These may be theoretically the same concentration, but different nominal concentrations. So if your check standard is a truly, it's not a revile, it's a different prep, you're going to want to give this a different unique level. Again, all we're doing is telling Chromillion that these are different concentrations. We're not entering in our concentrations of our standards here. It's just to designate which of these are the same concentration and which of them are different. Okay. Now, the next thing that we're going to have here is our position. Okay, so this is our actual vial location in our auto sampler. So I imported this from a, an old sequence, so it didn't pre-fill that in. Um, but of course, this is just, you know, what's your vial location? Now, here's your injection volume. Um, that information with this particular sequence didn't come over. So I'm going to call it 10 microliters. And I hit F9 to fill down. And you can see every injection now has a 10 microliter injection volume, um, which is obviously important in some of the calculations we're going to do. Injection volume is, is taken into consideration. Um, so we want to make sure that we have the correct injection volume in there. Now, when you acquire data natively in Chromillion, there's, of course, going to be an instrument method in there. But depending on how you export your data, how much information is associated with your data export, this may be a blank field. Um, we can always, you know, create a dummy instrument method. Uh, but do keep in mind that this would be where your instrument method resides for anything that you're going to run using Chromillion. The next column here is our processing method. Now, there was a default processing method that came over with this sequence. However, we're going to create a new one for this example, for this presentation. Uh, but you can see that there is a processing method already here. You can theoretically have one processing method for each injection. So you could technically have 26 different processing methods. Obviously not how we're wanting to work. So right now, you know, we're just going to use one processing method for all. 
But if you have different, you know, matrices and things like that, or your standards and samples are drastically different, um, you know, you may want to use a different um, processing method. Or if you're doing robustness or R&D work, right, you may process those injections different uh, because of the conditions that you're putting them through. And you certainly have that flexibility. Now, the next column here is your status. So this is your injection status. We can see all of these finished. There's no interrupted injections. There's no incomplete or idle injections. Everything has finished. And we can see the injection time that all of these injections occurred. Now, we also have a lock status. Um, this lock status, we're not going to talk much about, but you can lock particular injections so that you cannot change anything in regards to the injection list. Um, so you can't change their weights, their dilutions, the names, anything like that. So you can lock those down. The next couple columns here are, are for um, our weight dilution and internal standard. So here we have to remember that by default, Cremillion works a certain way. Now this can be changed, you know, depending on your uh, specific calculations. We can change report templates. We can change processing methods. We can make it so that you can calculate your data really any way that you would like. But by default, you're going to put your weights and your dilution factors in the injection list for your samples. So the standard concentrations are going to be added to the processing method. Okay, and we're going to look at that in the studio. But you're going to add your weights and dilutions um, to your samples here in the injection list. All right, so whatever your weights and dilutions factor is, you can insert here for all of your samples. Now, if you are running an internal standard, your internal standard amount can be added here as well. All right. There's a few other um, columns in here that we want to look at. One is replicate ID. So if you have a replicate, um, if you're doing, you know, one or triplicates or duplicates and you want a summary of those samples, you would just put in the same ID for all of the samples that you want. OK, so if you want these three samples to have, you know, be summarized in an injection table and these three samples to be summarized in an injection table, you just give them all the same replicate ID. It can be numeric, it can be alphanumeric, it could just be, you know, alphabetic, however you want to insert, but they just have to be the same. Okay. Now your comments here, this is just a comment section. You can write anything that you want in there. Uh, this is used a lot for filtration. So when we're doing our report templates, we can filter our report templates based on injection conditions. So you could say, you know, only show me uh, samples where the comment says true or things like that. So we can, we can certainly do that with comments. We can also do those with custom variables, which we'll briefly talk about. Next one here is our reinjection. Um, again, not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but what you can see is we have something called intelligent run control. So let's say you're running a, a system suitability test and you've got an assay. So you have a 2% RSD of your standards for each component that you have to meet. Okay, so you can set up a test in Cremillion that says if the you know, SST test pass, continue. If not, re-inject. You could re-inject the whole sequence. You could re-inject the last injection. You can re-inject just the standard block, right? And you can do that uh, a certain amount of times that you determine. So maybe after three failures, it aborts the sequence and it never actually gets to your samples. All right, this prevents you from actually piercing the septa on the vial that your sample resides in. It reduces the amount of mobile phase that you'll use. It reduces the amount of data review that you have to go through. Okay, so there, there's a lot of really neat things you can do with the system suitability test and the intelligent run control feature. Now, it will log all the re-injections here. So anything that you've done with an intelligent run control that re-injects, it'll tell you how many times it's re-injected and it will automatically add those injections to your sequence. Okay, so that's a pretty neat feature. We then have spike group. That's if you're doing standard edition stuff for the most part. We're not going to really talk about that. And then we do have a uh, custom variable here. We can see we have the sample underscore amount, and there's a little asterisk to the top left. This is letting me know that this is a custom variable that I've created in Cremillion. Um, we can make custom variables. We can make custom formulas, right? We can really get fancy with this stuff um, and, and add anything that you need to your sequence. So um, again, not something we're going to go in great detail about here, but something that makes Cremillion extremely flexible as far as data processing and reporting is concerned. So those are our standard columns. Um, I hope that helps you get an understanding of, of what each does. And again, if you have any additional questions, please let me know during the live session. Now, what you'll see down at the bottom 
before we start processing our data is this associated, item, associated items tab. Now what this is, is any met metadata that gets associated with the sequence will live here. So again, instrument methods, processing methods, report templates, view settings, all of those types of things are gonna be seen here in the associated items. Right now, all I have is this generic processing method that came over with the import. Um, we're gonna create a new processing method, which I'm gonna show you how to do in just a moment. Uh, but anything that you use with your sequence will be shown here. Yeah. All right, so now we are ready to go ahead and start processing. So as I mentioned, we're gonna process in the studio. We don't do any of our data processing here in the console, okay? Now to get to the studio, we can either click on the studio button up here at the top, or you can double click on any injection and it will actually load the studio to that injection. So you can see injection number seven. So you can click on studio or double click on any injection in your injection list and the studio will appear, okay? All right, so there's many ways to do things in Chromillion. So let's take a processing method, for example. You can create a processing method from the console. You can create a, a processing method from within the injection list. You can create a processing method from within the studio by clicking on Charlie and going to new and processing method. Okay, so I'm not gonna show you every way that you can do everything, um, but I will show you at least one or two ways to do most things. And, and, you know, it's kind of based on my preference, but there are additional ways. If you don't like the workflow that you see here, please let me know and I can show you alternative routes. All right, so before we start processing the data, I, I want to give you, you know, an overview of what the studio is. All right, so the studio is where we do all of our data processing and all of our reporting. However, we don't want you to have to go back and forth between console studio, console studio. That would be a very inefficient way of working. Okay, so within the studio, you do have your injection list category bar. This injection list is the same injection list that we were just playing with in the console. Any change that I make to the injection list here is, is duplicated, represented in the injection list that we saw in the console. So you don't have to open the console once you're in the studio doing your data processing. You can just select between these different category bars here. So these are all our category bars in the studio. Depending on what your license has, you may not see some of these. You may not need intact protein deconvolution. You may not need non-targeted MS processing, right? So if you don't have those licenses, some of these categories may not appear, but at its core, you're always gonna have injection lists, instrument method, data processing, report designer, and electronic report, okay? Now some other um, navigation tips. So within the studio, um, we everything is context sensitive and we do utilize the ribbon feature, just like your Microsoft Office products, um, such as Word and PowerPoint and Excel, right? Those all use ribbon features. Chameleon does the same thing. So right now, let's just take a look at these ribbons. So I can see at the top here that I have chromatogram tools as my active ribbon, okay? So right now you see in my panes, I have a chromatogram pane and I have an interactive results pane. So here's my chromatogram and down below here, here are my interactive results. So when I select my chromatogram, I get a chromatogram tools ribbon and my ribbons that change are the processing and layout. Data processing home pretty much always stays consistent no matter what screen you, or what window you have active. However, the ribbons underneath are what changes. So you know, when you first get started, this is probably my favorite place to tell people to look for things. If you can't find something, click on the chromatogram, go to processing. From here, you can uh, toggle on and off detection parameters. You can run the Cobra Wizard. You can run Smart Peaks. You can insert detection parameters. You can perform manual integration. You can create peak windows and add components to your component table. So there's a lot you can do here. So this is a great place to look when you can't find things. You also have a layout so you can toggle on and off certain things that you may or may not want to see. Now you'll notice if I click down below on my interactive results pane, I now have interactive results ribbons and those tabs have changed now to reflect the options of the interactive results table, okay? Now, if I go back to data processing home, what we'll find is we have a preset selection of all of these different panes that are available to you. So if you click the down arrow, you can see, you know, our full set of, of pre-selected views, all right? So if I wanna see my chromatogram, my calibration and my processing method, 
I can click on this preset. It's going to load that layout. And now I can see, you know, I have a different selection of items and potentially some different ribbons depending on what pane I have active at that moment. OK. Now, also over here in the navigation pane, you'll see these are all the injections of my sequence. So if I want to look at a specific injection, I can click on that injection or I can click on the injection buttons up top here or I can press F4 as a shortcut or shift F4 to go back. OK, so again, lots of different ways to do things. If I want to overlay injections, I can simply press the push pin. This will give me a stacked view. If I don't want stacked, I can click on these chromatograms and go to layout and I can say overlay and I can take off the time offsets. If I want to get a little advanced with it, I can actually now go in and say what percentage is the time offset? What percentage is the signal offense? Am I normalizing any of my signals? Right. So there's a lot of extra stuff that you can do that we don't show within the ribbons. And to get to that extra stuff, you can always just hit the down arrow of each particular category or double click on the chromatogram and you're going to get the same set of uh, properties in relation to a chromatogram. Now what you'll find below here is your channels of data acquisition in the sequence. We only acquired one channel, but if you acquired multiple channels, you know, many detectors have more than one channel. You would see all of those channels down down in this section. You'll notice the component tables blank right now because we do not have any components. Uh, but that will change once we create a new processing method. And then you can have multiple processing methods, as I mentioned, in your sequence. So if you have three, four, five different processing methods, you can actually click on each one and it's going to apply the conditions of that processing method to the injection that you're looking at, to, the, to that sequence. However, at the end of the day, it's going to use whatever processing method you have selected in your injection list. So just because I may have selected a different processing method in the view here, data processing, that's not at the end of the day what it's going to use. It's going to use what we have selected in our injection list. So just be cognizant of that. All right. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create my own processing method. OK, so what I want to do is I'm going to click on Charlie. I'm going to go to new and I'm going to say a new processing method. Now, I highly recommend quantitative, unless you're doing 3D quantitative or running mass spec. Um, then you might want to choose one of these two, but your quantitative layout is your best option. So you're going to choose quantitative and click next. You can rename it if you want. I'm going to leave a generic quantitative. And I'm going to apply these to all injections of my sequence. You can see there's some additional options, but in this case, I do want one processing method for all injections of my sequence. I'm going to click finish. Now we're going to see in this processing method tab below here, I now have two processing methods. Quantitative is the one that I'm actively processing with. And if I look at my injection list, you'll see quantitative is the one that it's going to use in the final calculations. So I now have a new generic default processing method. Stop this. OK, so now what we're going to want to do is we always start with integration, right? That's kind of the first step that we all start with. So what you'll see right now is that in my studio, I have my chromatogram pane active and my processing, main path, uh, processing method pane active. Now, when I'm processing, I also like to keep the interactive results tab open. There's going to be a lot of great information in interactive results uh, in regards to our peaks that are going to give us a better understanding of how we need to process our data. What are the best detection settings that we can use that are going to be applicable to those peaks? And we're going to see this in more detail here in just a moment. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to want to click on my detection tab. So you see I've got my detection tab of my processing method pane. All right, and this is where we start. And Chromillion set up really logically, so typically you're just going to go from left to right like you're reading a book. OK, so now I've got detection and I can do a couple things. I can go ahead and just start inserting manual detection parameters or I can go ahead and run the Cobra wizard. Um, the Cobra wizard is a tool that we provide in Chromillion to provide fast guided ways to get initial detection settings up and running. OK, so if I click on my Cobra wizard, what we're going to see is a set of options. We've got these 
five different options at the top and we're going to just step through each one. So the first one that we talk about is where is the area that we actually want to integrate? You can see in the beginning of this chromatogram, there's a lot of junk. We've got some dips, some void peaks. Um, it's really messy and noisy. So, you know, we may not want to integrate anything up until about this six minute mark or so. So what I can do is I can actually say, um, I want to left click and drag, and this is the only region of the chromatogram that I'm actually interested in integrating. So it's going to turn off integration, but anything before this peak right here, so 6.9. Okay. Now, if I want to be more specific, if I want this to be 6.9 exactly, or if I want it to be 7.0, right, I can go ahead and do that and, and set the time and make it more accurate than just dragging and dropping randomly. Also, if you've got a negative peak up front, you can say consider void peak. This way it's not going to integrate any of these negative void peaks up front. OK, um, if the peaks further out here, consider void peak may not work. There are other options we may want to look at to prevent integration of this peak right here. Uh, but in general, consider vo void peak is going to take care of most of this stuff. So I've told Chromillion where I want to integrate and I'm going to go ahead and go on to the next one. Uh, baseline noise range. Okay. Now, baseline noise range is really algorithmic sensitivity. Okay. This is a very critical uh, parameter and how efficient we are with integrating. All right. So let's say that we're running an assay, you know, well resolved, mostly large peaks. You know, we can make a baseline noise range over time where maybe there is little noise. Right, because we don't want that integrated. We're not looking at impurities potentially, right? We just want these main components. So what I might do is, you know, I might choose a range where there is a little noise and, and now Chromillion's not going to integrate anything that's similar to this peak, right? So this is our algorithmic sensitivity. We're looking at the change in slope, the deviation of slope, and we're telling Chromillion that, hey, in this range, there's some noise. Don't integrate anything that's similar to this peak right here. I'm just looking for big peaks. And that's one way you could go. Now, if we are looking for the small peaks, then what you want to do is you want to find a very flat portion of your baseline um, and maybe a very narrow range. Right now, I've actually gone down as low as like 0.1 or 0.001. So if I'm looking for every little change in slope, I might actually say I want my baseline noise range to be 20.030 to or 21.030 to 21.031, right? Within that range, there's almost going to be no deviation in slope possible. So it's going to be much more sensitive to any change in slope. And you'll see right away, we're picking up far more components than we had with our original selection when we were pretending it's just an assay. So you can use auto range. If auto range works well for what you're trying to accomplish, great. If not, just remember, am I looking for very large peaks? I might, you know, include some noise or am I looking, um, you know, for very small peaks Then I'm going to look for an area of my baseline with no noise and maybe a very small time range. OK, but this is algorithmic sensitivity is really what we're getting at. Now that I've chosen baseline noise range, I can move on to Cobra smoothing with. Um, within Cobra smoothing it with what we're primarily focusing on is the peak with a half height. All right. So. This is a value where, you know, we're going to look at the peak width at half height and determine if we're going to use auto or do we want to put in, you know, maybe multiple different smoothing widths. So right now I'm going to let it set at auto. But again, keep in mind, this is peak width at half height. Right. And it's kind of telling you with auto that this is the value that it's using. It's calculating. It's looking at the peak width to half height and it's taking its best guess and saying this is the value that we want to use. OK. All right. Next is your minimum area. So if there is a peak in here that you know you don't want to integrate anything smaller than that peak, we can actually zoom in on a peak. We can say don't integrate anything smaller than that. And, and now anything you can see, it took away a lot of those peaks. So some of these other peaks that were smaller, um, it's actually not integrating. So that's another step that you can use here. We also have a minimum relative area function. So this way it's not hard set to one specific number. It could be a relative percentage of area to a main peak. And that's a really useful one, especially if your standard concentration changes, your responses are changing. You know, you may only want to integrate a certain percentage of a main peak. So you can use that detection parameter as well. That's just not included in the wizard. All right. 
The final thing we're going to do is uh, tell it, all right, what channel and injection types do we want to apply these detection parameters to? So by default, it's going to apply it to all channels and all injection types. However, if you only want to apply specific things to specific channels or specific injection types, no problem. Choose the channel, choose the injection type. You're still only using one processing method, but now the algorithm is only going to apply those specific detection settings to those specific channels or those specific injection types. Right. So now that I'm done, I just click finish and you can see that drastically cleaned up um, all of our integration. However, we may want to start looking at some of these small peaks. So that was just a good example. I'm going to go ahead and remove the minimum area that it inserted. So we're going to get some more peaks in here. Right. And I'm leaving this all on auto and auto for now. Now, what you may find is, you know, when you run the Cobra Wizard, much of that is available already here in your detection area. So the consider void peak option is here. Your Cobra smoothing, we, uh, smoothing width is here. Your baseline noise range is here, right? So a lot of what you do in the wizard is also available right here. So if you don't want to run through the wizard, you just want to insert the parameters directly, please feel free to do so. Okay. All right. So now let's start getting a little more in depth into the algorithm. Um, within Chromillion, as soon as you apply a processing method to a sequence, it's going to take the default of every parameter and apply it. And as you can see, each one of these parameters has defaults. So the baseline type is drop perpendicular by default. Consider void peak right now is on by default. Um, the detect negative peaks is off by default. And you'll see each one has a default setting. So what, even without any manual interaction, Chromillion is just going to apply all the defaults and do its best job of integrating. Okay, so you always want to keep that in mind. The next thing that you're going to want to keep in mind is that once you turn on a detection setting, it will remain on for the duration of the chromatogram unless you go and turn that off. So let's take an easy example here. And let's look at inhibit integration. Okay, so inhibit integration means I'm going to turn off integration. So right now, if I'm at time zero, which is where it will apply this, and I turn on inhibit integration, you'll see. Um, let me actually delete all this. Okay, so now I'm going to go back and say inhibit integration on. You see now it is not integrating anything because from time zero on, we told it not to integrate. So now if I want to actually come in and, and integrate from say 6.25 forward, there's two ways that I can do this. I can click on the blue hyperlink to add. I can type in manually 6.15. I can find inhibit integration and then turn it back to off. Now it, it will, um, my time did not accept. Let me put, fix that. And now you can see from 6.15 on, it is integrating. Okay, so once you apply a detection setting, um, it will keep that setting until you turn it back off. So this doesn't just work for, you know, inhibit integration. This works for maybe tailing sensitivity factor or, you know, any of these other things. So there are certain regions of the chromatogram you may want to change a, a, a detection setting. You know, you'll turn it on and then you may turn it back off. Okay. And we'll, we'll see that as we move forward. Now, another cool way, uh, a way that I typically integrate is you can use your cursor to insert these detection parameters. So right now you'll see my cursor is this black X, okay? But if we look in the bottom right and pay attention to the bottom right, not my cursor, what you'll see is Chromillion's always gonna tell you where you are and what you're doing, okay? So right now I'm at 3.5 minutes, I'm at 0 0.041 atomic absorption units, and I'm zooming. If I move the cursor, then that information changes. Now, also when I move the cursor, you're gonna see the cursor is context sensitive and it changes as well. These are uh, manual integration events that I could perform. So you can see right now it's telling me I could move the delimiter. So let me zoom in, right? And maybe I wanna move the delimiter or maybe I wanna you know, move the, force the baseline to look like that. These are all manual integrations. So you can see the cursor changes and you can see in the bottom left what the cursor is doing as it changes, okay? Now I'm gonna get rid of this manual integration. So what I'm gonna do is I can either right click on the injection, you can see the little save tab. I've manually integrated this differently than every other injection. So there's a save tab unique to this injection. I can right click and discard it or I can go to processing and I can say remove manual integration. You'll notice when I do that as well that the manual integrated 
um, label at the top of the chromatogram goes away once I discard or remove the manual integration. Now we're going to try to avoid manually integrating, but if you must, wait till the end. And what I mean by that is do everything you can with your algorithm first and then manually integrate. Because if I manually integrate first, and then let's say, you know what, I don't want to integrate this region, I'm going to turn it off. What happens is it won't, the uh, manual integration overrides. So you can see the chromatogram has been manually integrated. Changes to the detection settings will not have any effect on this one chromatogram because this is the only chromatogram that I've manually integrated, right? So if I, I turned off integration, but you can see it's still integrating. Now, if I remove the manual integration, see how it stopped integrating? Now the algorithm overrides because there's no manual integration. So point is, is just do all of your manual or integrating last. Use the algorithm first, okay? All right, so now let's actually start playing around with the algorithm. Let's start looking at these chromatograms. Um, and we want to look at our interactive results pane down here. This is going to give us some good ideas of how we need to integrate our peaks, OK? All right, so let's start off. I'm starting off on a standard. You know, typically you want to start off on your most difficult injection or maybe your lowest level injection um, or maybe the injection with the most components. So you can start on a standard, you can start on a sample, you know, whatever you would like to start on. But I like to try to find typically the hardest one to integrate. In this example, though, the standard is pretty reflective of all the samples. So I'm going to go ahead and stick with the standard. Now we can see um, based on our view right that it's integrating here but it doesn't look like there's much to it so i can actually you know zoom in and see if there's actually some change in slope um you know you can left click and drag to zoom if you have a cursor with a scroll wheel this is my favorite i can actually scroll and then left click and drag and then scroll and then left click and drag and i get a really good view and i can see that there's actually some deviation in slope here which is why chromelion's integrating it but if we look at the level these are really small peaks so we may not want Chromelion to integrate these peaks, right? So there's a couple things we could do. Uh, you know, we can change the minimum area. We could change the minimum height requirement. We could change our Cobra smoothing width. Um, all right, so there's a lot of different things that we can do to go ahead and change how this gets integrated. But I just want to start off by, by pointing that out, you know, your zoom functions. You can also do the same here if you want to stretch or shrink um, on your x-axis. You can scroll over. You can do that cool stuff. Now, another thing that you could do is you could actually, you know, zoom in on a particular area. You can right click on that area and then say auto scale. Chromelion will auto scale that signal. And then I'm just using the arrows on my keyboard and you can see it's changing the scale and the view based on what's in frame. OK, so this is another really neat way of being able to have consistent views. Again, I really like scrolling over the X and Y axis. I feel like it gives me the best look at what my chromatogram actually looks like, what my peak actually looks like. But please feel free to do it any way that you would like. Also notice up in the top right here, we have a, a zoom box, right? I can change my view here. I can move things around. I can shrink this if I want. All right, so there's lots of different ways to look at your data. All right, so I'm going to go back to the full view. I'm going to start right here. And we're going to start looking at these things. So I'm going to ignore this for now. Um, you know, I can quickly get rid of this. I can turn off integration. I can change minimum area, that stuff. Now, what's really nice is, you know, when I select a peak, if you have your interactive results window open, Chromelion's telling you all the information about the peak. So it's telling you its retention time, what its area is, um, you know, what its peak width at half height is, which we know applies to the Cobra smoothing width. Um, so there's a lot of good information here. And, and we can quickly extract this information and determine what parameters and what values those parameters should be set at. All right, so I can actually, this is such a small area that the peak area is not even showing. Um, so what I may want to do is, you know, expand my format and show more, right? So now I can actually see how much area is in these. Or in my height, I can do the same thing, right? So I can come into my format and I can make my height, um, expand the, the values of my height so I can see what those are. So if you see zeros, it just means that it's not actually showing uh, far enough um, in your values, okay? So now I could say quickly, you know, I know that the uh, area of this component is 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 2. Um, so I could set a minimum area requirement and it would get rid of those. Right, so I can do some simple things like that. 
again, you know, you can just click on the blue hyperlink. You can go to minimum area and you can type in, you know, what the minimum area requirement is. So I could do, um, you know, 0 0.00004. All right, and I can apply, um, you know, these settings. And now it's not integrating that peak anymore. And in fact, it's not integrating a lot of those peaks as we can see pretty much only our main two components. So you can quickly, you know, eliminate unwanted peaks with your minimum area, no problem. Okay, but let's get that back for now. All right, so I'm gonna continue on and we're gonna look at some of these other components. Okay, so now let's take a peek here and, and let's get a better understanding of, of, you know, what parameters we need to use for the most efficient integration. So what I wanna start with is the type. Very critical parameter in Cremillion. So Cremillion's gonna qualify the peak automatically. Right. So we're going to look at, is this a baseline main peak? Is this a main peak? Is this a rider peak? Is this a shoulder peak? What type of peak is it? That way we know what type of detection setting we need to use. Right. If Cremillion is calling it a rider and we don't want riders to be detected, then we would turn rider detection off or maybe only on the fronts or on the tails. Um, but if it's not a rider, then it's going to be considered a shoulder peak. So do we want to detect shoulder peaks? By default, it's on. So you may not want to detect a shoulder peak. So you would turn that off. So the only way that you may know if it's uh, a right, what detection setting is going to work is you look at the type. And the type is going to tell you. Now, these acronyms are probably pretty foreign to you. So what I recommend you do is you double click on the type. You click on the help file here, the question mark. And it's actually going to pull right to this parameter. Okay, of what the peak type is. And here we see the description of the algorithms. So if we have a fully non-resolved peak, it's gonna be baseline, main peak, baseline. So you'll see BMB. Now, if we have some resolved, non-resolved peaks, we're gonna see baseline, main peak, and then a main peak because it's not starting at the baseline or ending at the baseline, it's just an M. And then we have a main baseline. But you can see this is all drop perpendicular. So if we use valley to valley, what you'll see is actually the letters become lowercase, right? So now I have a baseline, a main peak, but I'm doing a valley to valley. So I, I have a small b. And I have a BMB here, but lowercase b's because again, it's a valley to valley integration of a main peak, okay? So we can kind of see how Cremillion is qualifying these peaks so we know what detection settings to use. And then the other one is rider up and rider down. So if you see an RU or an RD, you know Cremillion's considering this a rider peak. So if you want to turn off rider detection, then you know which value to use. What you'll notice is shoulder peaks aren't called out. So if you have something integrating like this, but it's not calling it a rider peak, that means it's a shoulder peak. And instead of turn off rider detection, you're going to turn off shoulder detection. So understanding what type of peak Cremillion is qualifying it is very critical into understanding how to best use the algorithm. OK, so those are your types of peaks. So interactive results, again, I love to have these open while I'm performing you know, my detection and my integration. Now, another thing to be very cognizant about is the minimum and maximum rider ratio values. All right, so what does that mean? Well, again, with Cremillion, everything has a default. So your maximum rider ratio value is by um, default set to 20%, but you can see it can go from 0 to 100. We then have the minimum rider ratio and it's set to 10. So by default, you have a 10 to 20% region of what Cremillion is going to call a rider peak. But still, what does that mean? All right, well, let's take a peek at our help file. So what is a rider ratio? So we're looking at maximum rider ratio right now. So what we can see is we have a group of non-resolved peaks. And in every group of non-resolved peaks, there's always going to be one that's taller. It may not be much taller, but it will be taller. OK, so this is going to be our B peak, our tallest peak. Then we're just creating a ratio, right? So we're taking H sub N. So each one of these is H. So this is H1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? And we're going to create a, a ratio. So we're going to do H sub 1 divided by B times 100. And that'll be the ratio for this peak. H sub 2 divided by B times 100. That's the ratio of this peak to B, and so on and so forth. So what you'll find is with the default settings, you have a maximum rider ratio of 20% and a minimum rider ratio of 10%. So only a 10% region of these non-resolved peaks would actually be considered rider peaks. Otherwise, they're going to be shoulder peaks. 
if I want these to be rider peaks so that I can exponentially or tangentially skim them or something like that, I may want to increase this value. So I may want to take this up to 80% and 20%. So 80% max, 20% min, right? That means that anything within the ratio of 20 to 80% of B will be considered a rider peak, okay? So this is a very critical parameter to understand how riders and shoulders are qualified by the algorithm, all right? Now I'm gonna show you a pretty cool tool here uh, that can kind of do some of this for you automatically, but it is important to understand um, you know, what the type is and what your maximum and minimum rider ratios are so that you can, you know, choose the correct detection parameter as you're processing your data. Once you get this down, integrating gets very quick. You're not going to typically spend, you know, your 30 minutes to an hour processing data or more. Um, you should be able to integrate this stuff very quickly once you understand how the algorithm is working, especially because all the information you need is presented on screen in the interactive results. Okay. Now, the tool that I just mentioned that kind of does this for you automatically is what we call Smart Peaks. So to activate Smart Peaks, I can click on my chromatogram, I'll click on processing, and I click on Smart Peaks, right? Real easy. Then I just highlight the non-resolved region of peaks, and I'm gonna get multiple different options on how those peaks could be integrated. Really what this is doing is it's making the minimum rider ratio zero, the maximum rider ratio 10, and it's pretty much saying everything within this region is a rider except for the main peak B, right? And, and you can see the detection settings that it's gonna insert to achieve that. So maybe I wanna exponentially skim some of these. I can click that, and now it's actually added those detection settings, zero and 100 exponential, back to default at the end, right? Back to um, rider skimming tangential. So all the defaults are restored. Um, but all I had to do was left click and drag over this region. And now you see that this is exponentially skimming along our primary peak, right? And you can see these are rider ups now, okay? So now that I know that they're rider ups, Right, I might be able to do things if I don't want them to be integrated as riders, right? I can maybe come in here and say rider detection off and turn that off. Now there's no rider peak in there any longer, right? Now it's integrating it with that drop perpendicular. And you can see the types are no longer called riders because we're not detecting them as riders anymore. They're treating them as main peaks, right? So that's why it's really important to understand this maximum and minimum rider ratio. And, and understand what type of peak you're dealing with so you know which detection parameter is gonna work best. Because if I, let's say you think these look like shoulder peaks. If I come in and insert a detection parameter and say detect shoulder peaks off, right? It's still going to skim, it's still gonna integrate that stuff. And this can get very frustrating for an end user, not understanding why this looks like a shoulder peak, but it's still integrating it like a rider peak. It's because the tech shoulder peaks won't work there because that's a rider, not a shoulder, okay? So now I'm gonna come back and delete. Anything that doesn't work, you're gonna to wanna to delete. Less is more, all right? So for the example of smart peaks, you know, we got the point, but I'm gonna go ahead and delete these settings, all right? Because if something doesn't work the way I want it to, I immediately get rid of it. Uh, less is more, that way I don't introduce conflicting, uh, you know, detection settings, and then Chromelion starts getting confused by what you want it to do because you conflicted it, all right? Okay, so, we, you know, there's other options here as well. Let's focus on this peak group for a little bit longer. Um, we can actually, you know, detect this all as one peak um, by changing some certain settings. So, you know, we may want to change this to, uh, you know, our rider smoothing or our, our smoothing width, I'm sorry. So our Cobra smoothing width, we may want to change. And we may want to say, you know, from this region here, you know, my, my smoothing width um, is the peak width at half height. So I can see what all my peak widths at half heights are, um, right? So I could come in here and I could change the Cobra smoothing width in this region and tell it that the peak width at half height is actually, you know, maybe 0.5. That way it integrates it all as one peak. Now, the other thing that you can do, well, one of the other things you can do is you could um, use this peak group start and peak group end function. So maybe if I want this to all integrate as one peak, I'll say fix, so start integrating at 9.488. Now you'll see it's integrating everything as one peak. So what I wanna do here is I'll come back to this side where I want the peak to stop and I'll say peak group end, I'm gonna fix that time hit okay, and now it's just integrating this all as one peak, 
right? So I could choose to integrate this as one peak. I could choose drop perpendicular. I could choose riders. I could choose valley to valley, right? There's all sorts of different ways that we can affect how this peak gets detected. It's all about understanding the algorithm and how it's best applied, right? So these are some of the major factors. Um, there's a lot of different detection settings in here and some of them with multiple different options. So if we look at right peak type, we can see we have valley to valley, we have drop perpendicular, we can actually lock at the current level of the baseline, or we can find the lowest point of the baseline and lock the baseline down there. So there may be multiple um, you know, options with each parameter name. There may be more values for each name, right? But you can simply scroll through the list and see what's there. I want to highlight a couple more of them. Um, you know, we have, we've already talked about baseline type, consider void peak and detect shoulder peaks. Um, you know, we've talked about minimum and maximum rider ratio, inhibit integration, um, but we also have some other ones, right? So we have fronting sensitivity factors. So if we think that this peak's fronting a little too much, um, you know, I could put in a fronting sensitivity factor. In the inverse, if it's tailing a little too much, I can put in a tailing sensitivity factor. You can see the default is off, um, but the range is from off and zero to 100. So the higher percentage that I go, the less it's going to integrate the tail. So if I take this to 50%, right, we're going to have far less integration on the tail than I would if I do this at 2% or 1%, right? So we can look at our sensitivity factors for fronting and tailing, all right? And again, you're going to want to turn them on and off potentially, right? So if I had come over here to this other region, you know, if I say, okay, I want to insert a tailing sensitivity factor of 10%, right that's going to screw up our integration so maybe what i want to do is find you know a, a better representation maybe two percent or maybe a uh, half of a percent right but i may not want this half percent tailing uh, tailing sensitivity factor to continue and affect my other peaks so i'm going to come over here and i'm going to turn my tailing sensitivity factor back to off that way only this time from 13.7 to 14.9, am I using a 0.5% tailing sensitivity factor? The rest of these components now are gonna be using my default of off, right? So you may wanna turn things on or off. Just remember, once I turn it on, it doesn't get, it's gonna use that value until I turn it back off, okay? Now a few others, uh, here's your you know, minimum area and height, minimum area and relative height, um, minimum signal to noise ratio, right? So if there's a signal to noise limit that you don't, uh, that you have to meet, right? You can put that in there. Um, there's your rider detection and rider skimming. So these are your three different options for rider skimming. Um, and, and then again, your sensitivity factor. So those are the primary ones. Uh, obviously, you know, it takes a moment to get used to a new algorithm, but once you get used to it, it's extremely easy to use. Everything is displayed to you in your interactive results in real time. So you have all the information available to you to be able to quickly process your data. And everything is calculated in real time. So before we move on to the component table, I, I want to show you the dynamic updating that Chromillion provides. So right now we can see a peak area of 0 0.01. But let's say I manually integrate this. I want to make this peak area larger. You'll see in real time that updated to 0 0.015. If I discard that change again, you'll see it goes back to 0 0.010, right? So anytime I make a change in Chromillion, it's instantly updated. My results are instantly provided to me and I have real time information on how I need to integrate, how I need to process my data, right? Which is, is more to be, we can, no one else really has this dynamic updating like Chromillion does. Usually you batch process or you have to press buttons to get the changes to apply, not in Chromillion. As soon as you make a change, it's dynamically updated. Um, so you, it, it saves a lot of time in that aspect as well. Okay. Now I know we're running short on time. It's only, we're at about 59 minutes already. So I, I might try to go for 10, 10 more minutes to cover the component table and just the generic setting up of calibration. And of course you can, you know, ask any additional questions that you want in our live session and we can create more of these videos uh, for, you know, tailored content. So I, I can put these out weekly. Um, or if you want, you know, a live demonstration, you know, contact me or one of your point people at DuPont and we can schedule some time where I can go over with this with you, uh, you know, remotely or in person once things, you know, get back to normalcy. Okay, so that's all we're going to talk about for the detection. We're going to look at the component table now. 
Um, so once we've integrated anything that's been detected, we can go ahead and run the component table wizard upon. Another wizard that helps you get through. So we can see we have 11 components that were integrated in this chromatogram. Um, if I don't want to name a certain subset of components, right, I can just choose the area that I want it to name. And you can see it updates. It's only component one, two, three, four here. It'll still integrate these. It's just not going to identify them in my component table. But if I want to use the whole chromatogram, I can go to auto range and that's fine. If I want to filter out any other peaks, like maybe I don't want to name peaks, you know, with an area greater than or, or you know, a height greater than a relative area, etc. I can do that. But in most cases, we're just going to want to name all the peaks that are in there. Then I have a quick overview of, of, you know, all the generic components, their retention times and their windows, and I can click finish. And now I have a component table. You also see now in my navigation pane here, all of those components are shown and it actually is letting me know that they're all detected. What you'll find is if a peak's not detected, there'll be a red X over that molecule and it'll say component is not detected. So you can look at your component list very quickly for each injection and see which of these components have been found and which of these components have not been found in particular injections. Okay. All right, so there's a couple other things within the properties of these components now that are, are certainly worth taking a look at. Um, so let me get back. Let me select a, a component. Okay, so I've got a uh, component nine selected. You can see it highlights component nine. I can look at the properties now. So here's where I can look at all my different component properties. You know, what's my retention time? Is this a reference component for RRTs? Um, am I looking at absolute times or relative percentage of the time? Um, and then, you know, based on if I choose absolute or relative, you know, I have different algorithms for component matches that I can use to correctly identify my components. You know, this is very useful in, in scenarios where we've got a lot of non-resolved components. You know, there's peak windows overlapping. You know, we can get these components identified very quickly by setting up, you know, what our window and what our component match algorithm looks like. And you can quickly navigate through components by pressing on the molecule. You'll see it updates in real time in my interactive results and in my component table, which component we're looking at. And if I'd rather just, you know, select a component, I can hit the drop down and say, all right, I want to look at component one. And then it's going to update me to everything about component one. If we look at evaluation next, we can see, you know, are we basing our evaluation on area, uh, relative area, height, relative height, capillary electrophoresis area. Um, you know, if we're using an internal standard or not can be designated here and the peak type. So remember when we were looking at the type below, right? So we were looking at BM or RU or BMB or whatever, um, you know, Chromelian set to auto detect. But if I want to force something to be a rider, I want to force something to be a main peak. I can do that with the peak type. It's best to use the algorithm to do that. But if you're really in a bind and you want to force something, you choose which component and you say component one is a rider and, and then, you know, it'll, it'll behave as a rider moving forward. Lastly, but one of the most important things in here is our, our calibration, right? So we may want every component to have a cal curve. We may want, um, you know, only a few of them to have cal curves. So again, you know, we're talking about every component here. We can set it up individually. You know, component one, because they're those small peaks in component two, those might not, you know, be something that we want to have calibration plots set up for. So we may say, I want to calibrate this off of component four. And if there's a relative response factor, I can type in my relative response factor. Okay, so you can do those. You can do RRFs, you can qualify and quantitate off of other components or every component can have its own calibration curve. Now from here, we're looking at things like, is it linear, is it quadratic, is it cubic, polynomial, um, you know, point to point, average, um, you know, what, what's the function that we're using? Are we weighting this function at all? You know, we have a lot of different weighting features. And then uh, over here, you know, are we ignoring the origin? Are we forcing through the origin? Are we computing with the origin? Um, you know, these are very important. If you're using a single point calibration, uh, you have to force through the origin. You have no calibration if you do not force through the origin in the single point calibration because you need at least two points for the line, right? Now, if you're doing a multi-point calibration, you may want to ignore the origin. You may want to force through the origin, which is highly unusual, but you might. Or you may want to use the origin point zero, zero, but not force through it. 
So that's when you would use compute with origin. The point zero zero is in there to determine the best fit line of your curve. However, it's not gonna force it through zero zero. So it's really up to you and your method development and how you guys work to determine which of these calibration settings that you would use, except for a single point you must force through the origin, okay? All right, so that's our component table. There's a lot more in de uh, you know, detail that we can get um however you know that's where we're going to stop today with the component table the last thing that i want to talk about is you know setting up your calibration so i'm going to go ahead and have a calibration plot up here yeah i clicked my caliban pm preset you can see the three panes that are in use and then of course you know with the ribbon feature depending on what i click on i get div different ribbons so to end this let's just um look at setting up calibration everything that you must do so in order to have a calibration curve, first and foremost, you must have a type that says calibration standard. It could be one injection, it could be 10 injections, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that whatever you wanna use in your cal curve, you call a calibration standard. Next is you must have a level. Again, these are concentration levels. Now these are not the levels of concentration, it's just saying these are the same concentration. This was a different prep. Could be theoretically the same concentration, but because it was a different prep, it will have a different nominal concentration, and therefore we're gonna have another level. So you have to have your levels. The other thing you must have, obviously, is a processing method. Without a processing method, you can do no processing, no quantitation, no calibration. So make sure you have a processing method associated with that. And then also keep in mind, by default, this can change if you would prefer you know, we can build templates so that you put in your standard weight and your standard dilution in the injection list. But by default, your standard weight and dilution factors are for your samples. So we're not gonna insert any information of our standards by default in our injection list. What we're gonna do is in our data processing category bar, in the component table column, you'll see I have level one and level two. This is where I'm gonna insert my concentrations. If everything's the same concentration, great. I put in 10, maybe it's 10 mg per mil. I can hit F9, and now all of them are 10 mg per mil. This one might be, you know, 9.5 mg per mil. This one might be 5 mg per mil for that component, right? But this is where I'm going to enter in the concentration of my calibration standards. Level one and level two are here because I chose only two levels in my injection list. If I created a third level, right, then I go back to data processing it will automatically create that level three column. Okay, but this is where we're gonna put our concentration for our, our standards, okay? Now, the last thing that we need to know is we need to have our calibration plot open, but you'll also see that it's not creating a calibration plot, which seems strange because I should have everything that I need to set up a calibration plot. Well, in this case, you need to make sure that it's been selected. And in this case, you can see I'm not forcing through the origin, so I click force through the origin, I close it, and then I can come back and I can have a calibration plot. I can hover my cursor over it. I see which injections it's using, what its concentration is of 10, um, what the value is uh, as far as area, it's 0.032 uh, AUs per minute, right? So I can come in here and quickly set up calibration. I can look at each component individually, or I can turn on the smart link and I can see all of my calibration plots simultaneously. Right now you can see most of these I didn't set to force through zero. So if I wanna quickly fix that, I can choose cal type I know is linear, force through zero, I can hit F9, um, and then it'll go ahead and update all of these so that each one is forced through zero and has its own calibration plot. If I don't wanna see them all simultaneously, I turn off smart link and then I see I've got component four selected, component four selected, therefore I have a component four calibration curve. Okay, so very, very easy. And now keep in mind, you know, this we're pretending this is the first time we've ever set anything up in Chromelion. Once you set all this stuff up, you create it, we can create a template um, and then you just, you know, file save as or launch an e-workflow and you don't have to reproduce the wheel, right? The only thing you may do is update your concentrations. You might update some detection settings and some retention time stuff, but right, everything else will be templated. So you can just get your results instantaneously. That includes the report as well, which we're not talking about today, but we will talk about in a future session, okay? So I know that was a lot in about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, I hope that was very useful. 
Uh, you know, I, I know that these are strange times and doing this stuff and pre-recorded is, is not normal for many of us. However, you know, we're doing the best that we can. So I hope that this was worth your time. I hope this shows you really the ease of use and some of the in-depth uh, features that the algorithm has when you're doing your data processing and at least gets you to wet your whistle so you know what you're getting yourself into as you continue this evaluation and we can certainly go into any topic that you would like in far greater detail either in uh, next sessions a live q a or some one-on-one -on -one time all right but so i'd like to thank everybody for joining and listening in today um, if you do have any other questions you know please write them down and we will set up a time for a live q a session all right. Well, thanks, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Stay, stay healthy and have a great day.